everybody. God bless you. It's so good to be together in the Lord's house today. How many of you know we serve the one who still commands and the winds and waves obey his voice? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to come over with me to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. We're going to wrap up our look at the book of Galatians today. While you're headed over there, just chapter 6 and verse 11. Galatians 6, 11, Paul says, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, Peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. And then Paul concludes the letter by saying, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Have a serious word for you this morning, church, but also it's a word of hope and freedom. I want to share with you about this. My boast is in the cross of Christ. My boast is in the cross of Christ. Let's bow our hearts and pray together and ask the Father's blessing upon us as we look into the word of God today. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the beautiful name of Jesus, the name that opens heaven's door. We thank you for giving us your word. It is the lamp for our feet and the light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like good seed. So, Father, would you let our hearts be good soil right now to receive that seed of the word of God and bear fruit. Jesus said the words that he speaks to us are spirit and life. So, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come now to the people of God and minister life, abundant life to us from the words of Scripture. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we've been journeying through what we're calling God's letters from heaven, and those are the letters from the apostles to Christians in the early church. You will remember that before Jesus died, he told his friends he still had many more things to say to them. We read that after his resurrection, he continued to tell them about the kingdom of God. And after he ascended to the Father, the Bible says that he gave apostles and prophets and other leaders to the church. The apostles and prophets would become the foundation of the church. And Jesus Christ himself, you know, he is the chief cornerstone of the church. Amen. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And one of the ways that Jesus does build his church is through the living voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to his people through the New Testament letters. In these letters, Peter and John and Paul and others were inspired by God to convey to us the wisdom that we need to live out our faith. How many of you know that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword? Amen. It teaches and encourages us. So we've been looking together at these letters from heaven and letting them guide us. And today we've come to the point where we are wrapping up Paul's letter to the Galatians. If you haven't been with us, Galatia was part of Asia Minor. And that was an important territory of the Roman Empire. It's that land bridge that connects Asia and Europe. It's roughly equivalent to the nation that we call Turkey today. And we've said that the Galatians were young Gentile believers in Jesus who were being targeted by false religious teachers. Some Jewish believers in Jesus were trying to convince the Galatians that in order to be accepted by God, they would have to be circumcised and they would have to keep the law of Moses. Paul was amazed that they would walk away from the freedom that they'd been given in Christ. He was disturbed that they were now going to turn away to seek acceptance with God through keeping rituals and dead religion. So when Paul begins his letter to them, he didn't start out, we saw, with his customary warm greetings. Instead, he began sharply. He said, I'm astonished that you were so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ, and you're turning to a different gospel. I know I shouldn't have put that up there because you're all trying to figure out what it is. Denise will help you out after the service. We'll decipher that. 
Paul starts his letter with a strong word because they're on the verge of abandoning the truth of God. Paul goes on to say that the gospel is not man's message at all. It is a word from heaven. And Paul himself received it directly from heaven from Jesus Christ himself. Later on, we read in Galatians how uh, Paul met together with Peter, James, and John, and they all confirmed that they were all in agreement about the message of the gospel. So over the past few weeks, we've been looking at the powerful truths that make Galatians so important if we want to not only understand our salvation, but also live it out. In chapter 2, Paul confronted Peter. He stood up for the truth that no one can be saved through keeping the law of Moses. We emphasize that if there had been any law, he said, that could have made people righteous, then Jesus died for no reason. Paul says no one can earn salvation in any case. Being right with God, being in right standing with God is a gift. It's a gift that we receive when we place our trust in Jesus Christ. That's how it was in the case of Abraham. Paul explained, we saw in chapter 3, that when Abraham believed in God, God credited righteousness to his account. It's the same way with us. When we believe, instead of seeking to earn our salvation, God will credit righteousness to your account, to my account as well. We become the children of Abraham, and when we do, we inherit all of those good promises that God made to Abraham. We saw in the middle of the letter that Paul went on to assert that the blessings of salvation are received by faith, by trusting in Christ, and not because of our efforts. It's by our trust in him that we become children of God by adoption. How many of you are glad that God has adopted you as daughters and sons? So now we have a heavenly father, and we have a new family in him. We receive the Holy Spirit by faith, not by striving. We receive freedom from the captivity of the devil, and we receive power. Power from God in the inner man to do what is right. We couldn't buy those blessings. We couldn't inherit them. We certainly couldn't gain them by keeping any law. We couldn't get them by doing good works. But all of those blessings and more we can enjoy now because we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ and in the blood of his cross. Amen. We know within our hearts now that God is our Abba Father. We moved on through chapter 5, and we saw that God empowered us to serve each other, to serve one another in love instead of serving ourselves. We saw that we can live holy. Your flesh, our flesh doesn't have to dictate who we are or what we become. With God's help, we can walk in the Spirit. We can bring forth the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, and all of those good things. The beautiful character of Jesus is now being reproduced within us because we're walking in the Spirit. As we come into chapter 6 now, the last chapter in the letter, Paul's going to summarize it all. He's going to wrap it all up powerfully with one final shot of truth. There's a final warning in here against religious hypocrites, and there's a plea to run away from religion itself. And he calls us one last time to look at the peak, to look at the summit of our faith, the centrality of our faith, which is trusting in the work of Jesus Christ upon his cross. For Paul, the heart of faith is not just trusting in the cross, but even boasting in it, boasting in the cross that the world hates so much. You know, with all the strong language that Paul has already used, calling out Peter as a hypocrite, calling the Galatians fools, that's one we don't try too much from the pulpit. (laughs) Saying that they're under a witchcraft spell, we don't use that one too much either. But this is actually the most shocking line in the whole book. Paul says, far be it from me that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. This doesn't strike us the way that it struck his original audience. You see, you and I are used to the soft religious idea of the cross. And because we have never seen its real nature... We are comfortable with the cross as jewelry or as a decoration. But I can imagine that Christians and non-Christians alike would have flinched, maybe involuntarily, when they heard Paul say he was boasting in the cross. Boasting in the cross. Who could boast in a cross? 
people in the ancient world would have said, only a madman could boast in somebody's cross because the cross was an object of horror. It represented disgrace like nothing else did. Crucifixion as a punishment was something that was reserved for slaves and murderers and the worst of criminals. The cross was so terrible that you would not even say, if you were a Roman, you would not even say the word cross in public, in polite society. A Roman judge, even when they were sentencing someone to die on the cross, they didn't even want to say the word cross. They would instead say, hang him on the unhappy tree or the unlucky tree, because it was so horrible they did not even want to say the Latin word crux, cross. You see, unlike us, people at the time of Jesus were familiar with the reality of the cross. The empire punished people who were rebellious in massive group crucifixions. Next door to Nazareth, where Jesus grew up, there was a much more important city called Sephorus. And Sephorus revolted against Rome around the time of Jesus' birth. And when they did, the Romans responded by burning Sephorus to the ground and by nailing up 2,000 people on crosses and lining their crosses along the sides of the road on the way to Jerusalem. The cross was a weapon of psychological terror. The most famous Roman orator, many of us have heard of him, was Cicero. Cicero called the cross, quote, a most cruel and disgusting punishment. He said, the very mention of the cross should be far removed, not only from a Roman citizen's body, but also from his mind and his ears and his eyes. So, you see, even the callous Romans who had roughly conquered the world were afraid to talk about the cross. But now here comes Paul and he says, God forbid that I should boast in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why does Paul boast in the cross? Why do we as believers boast in it or why should we at any rate? Don't we know that Paul admitted even himself in another place that the idea of a crucified Savior was completely offensive to some people and to others completely ridiculous? Well, there are four reasons why we can boast, why we can glory in the cross of Christ, and we need to share them together. Why do we make our boast in Jesus' cross? The first reason is this. The cross is superior to religion. The cross is superior to man's religion. Religion is a guiding principle in the lives of many people. There are good motivations, of course, but family pressures, guilt, and many other things compel people to choose religion as something by which they will organize their way of life. Sometimes people are confused when they hear Christians using the word religion in a negative way. In our society, right, it's the case that religion is usually a positive term. To be called a religious person is generally a compliment, not an insult. But in the Bible, we can see that religion can often be the opposite of a living, genuine faith and trust in God. That's because religion encourages men to serve God and to seek acceptance by God through the keeping of rituals and rules and commands. Religion is a Latin word, and it's uh, an interesting word. It means, it meant literally back in the day, that you were tying people up with cords. Can you imagine that? That's what religion means literally, that you're tying people up with cords. It has to do with the idea of placing obligations on people. And, of course, that's exactly what some religious leaders do. Isn't that what Jesus himself said about the scribes and the Pharisees? He said, they tie up heavy burdens that are hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders, and yet they themselves are not even willing to move at them with a finger. They do all of their deeds in order to be seen by people. That can be the nature of religion. And the cross is superior to religion because religion makes an empty boast that it can satisfy your heart. Religion falsely promises people that if we only do enough, if we only can obey God perfectly enough, that God will accept us. 
This is important, church. Religion fails to minister life to people. Instead, it leaves their hearts the same as before and may be worse because external ceremonies can never take away your internal weaknesses. An outward ritual can never fix an inward shortcoming. Religion can only address the things that I do, but the cross of Jesus Christ can deal with what I am. It's what I am that makes me do the things that I do. And only the blood of Jesus can reach my heart, can cleanse my heart. And that's the place from which my thoughts and actions flow. Can we do a little old time gospel today? Is this all right? See, Jesus said, what comes out of a man, that is what defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries. Here, here comes another one of those lists. Evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a man. How many of you know Jesus was not into self-esteem? Religion can never reach your inner man no matter how much it promises you peace. It fails to help people who are bound by it. But the cross can make people free. Hallelujah. The cross will reconcile us to the Father, but religion will give us a host of false fathers who are not only bound themselves, but they cause other people to be bound with them. That was the case in Galatia. We've seen throughout this letter that Paul possessed the love of a true spiritual father for the church. That's why he was so alarmed that they had been victimized by wolves that had come to devour the sheep. We read in verse 11 today that he wants them to see what large letters he's writing. Now, Paul wasn't saying here that he had written a lengthy letter, you know, a lot of pages in the letter. You know that sometimes people have too much to say. You know, you ever get that email from somebody that really should be a book? You know the one I mean? So Paul wasn't saying that he had written a lengthy letter, but he was talking about the size of the actual letters he was making as he wrote. People who were not professional scribes in those days tended to write in big capital letters instead of small cursive script. Remember those kids in school, if you're of a certain age, remember those kids in school that had perfect penmanship and you, di you didn't like those kids, right, that had perfect penmanship? All right, well, Paul was not one of those kids. We don't know if it's because he had eye problems or what the reason was, but in any case, by Paul saying that, this was Paul's way of letting them know that he himself, in his own hand, had written this entire letter. Paul usually dictated his letters, but usually at the end he would write a few lines in his own handwriting so that people would know the letter was really from him and not a counterfeit. When he wrote to the Galatians, he used his own hand all the way through instead of dictating to a secretary. Now that, in the ancient world, was a personal touch. That was a caring touch that would have been noticed as soon as they opened the letter. It would have been easy for the Galatians to take note of that and contrast Paul's thoughtfulness with the lack of true concern that they saw on the part of the false teachers. How many of you know that a true spiritual father is thoughtful? Amen. Paul said, they, those men, are interested in getting you to make a mark in your flesh, but I have the true marks of Jesus in my body, he said. I have marks of scourging. I have other scars, he's referencing, that show you how much I love Jesus and how much I love you because those are things that I have suffered for your sake, Paul was telling them. That's the mark that I care about. You know, there are a few characteristics here of false teachers that Paul gives us. I don't want to take a quick detour here because we need to take heed to them. We know the scripture tells us that deception is going to be one of the chief dangers of living in the last days. So when Paul gives us warnings or gives us insights like this, we should listen to them. Paul said, false teachers want to make a fair showing in the flesh. That means literally that they want to put on a good face is what it says. 
false teachers are more concerned with appearances than they are with substance. Jesus said that the Pharisees loved people to see them doing their good works and prayers, but they missed the substance, the reality of the faith. They chose instead, as false teachers do, to choose the applause of men. And you know what Jesus said. Jesus said that would be all the reward that they would ever receive. Paul said that false teachers behave this way because they want to avoid being persecuted for the sake of the cross. Now, false teachers can have no problem promoting ethics or morality. They may even do good works. They may even talk about serving God and serving other people. But you will find that the message of the cross of Jesus was always offensive to false teachers, and it's the same way nowadays. The Bible shows us consistently how false teachers compromise the word of God at important points. And because of that, because they refuse to love the truth, ultimately, without even wanting to, they can become the enemies of God. You see, the Jesus of the Bible, the message of salvation through his cross, and the message of living a holy life are an embarrassment to them. And so they can never completely sign off on the gospel. But Paul said, even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you any other gospel than the gospel you've already received, let him be considered accursed. For false teachers, it is always a matter of something instead of Jesus or Jesus plus something. And as we've said before, when your salvation becomes something about Jesus plus, you've actually then become minus Jesus. Paul says we can learn to spot false teachers quickly because they are hypocritical. Paul says this law that they want you to follow, they don't even keep it themselves. They are poor role models even if they're claiming to speak for God, you will find that their lifestyle, that the things that they are ambitious about are not worthy of your imitation. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. So eventually false teachers will give themselves away. We would say that they throw themselves under the bus. They say one thing and do another and so reveal themselves. And in order to justify their own conscience, they seek to pull you into the same system that has trapped them as well. Paul says false teachers don't boast in Jesus or his cross because they want to boast in you. They boast in the number of followers that they have gained. They boast when you imitate them. They boast when you copy their style and mimic their catchphrases and the way that they say things. Paul said, imitate me, yes, but he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But see, to false teachers who boast in their religion, you and I are just another trophy, just one more person that they've won over to their pet doctrine. They want you to conform to their position instead of being conformed to the image of Christ. Paul had prayed, we saw back in chapter 4, that believers, that his spiritual children would be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. He prayed that way because he cared about them. They were his children in the faith. But listen, this is so important. False teachers will only try to conform you to themselves. Dead religion is always a dead end. It promises us fulfillment, but it delivers only disappointment. If you've been burned by religion, then you know that the cross is superior to religion because it ministers life and it ministers peace to people who come to God through the cross. It brings you into true spiritual partnership with fathers who will care for your soul. Why do we make our boast in Jesus' cross? The first reason is because the cross is superior to religion. The second reason we make our boast in the cross is because the cross is superior to the flesh. We make our boast in the cross because the cross is superior to the flesh. Just like religion is, the flesh is also a way of life for many. When we use the expression, the flesh, what are we talking about? Last week, we talked quite a bit about the flesh in the sense of that impulse that we all have inside us to resist the Holy Spirit. Paul is using the term the flesh in a different way here, but it is a way that 
we're all familiar with. We saw in our reading that false teachers want to make a good show in the flesh. And we see that Paul sometimes uses the term the flesh to talk about human accomplishments. In that sense, the flesh stands for all the things that you and I are proud of. Uh Uh-oh, can we get in each other's grill here for a few minutes this morning? Paul says in the word, hey, if you think you can trust in the flesh, I can top you. And if you have one of those friends that's a topper, you know what a topper is? When you tell a story, you have this fantastic story, and you tell the story, and your topper friend says, oh, that's nothing. I can top that. Let me tell you. So Paul was a topper before he met Jesus. He said, you think you can trust in the flesh? I can top you. I've got all the qualifications. I was the right religion. I had the right ancestry, the right pedigree. I was in the right political party. And guess what? In my political party, I was the most hardcore member. I made all my quotas. I was over the top in everything I did. In Galatians 1, he said, I was far ahead of all my fellow Jews in my zeal. Fleshly accomplishments are what people of this world admire. It's what we want to see in others, and it's what we aspire to ourselves. We admire the best. Let's be honest. Most kids, when we're young kids, we don't hang a picture of the third string quarterback up on the wall, guys, right? And before he met Jesus, Paul was that way. He would have looked down at anybody who wasn't at his level, who didn't dress for success the way that he did. And of course, many of us can be the same way. It's a funny thing about human nature. You know, people of higher status can look down on people who don't have their attainments. But of course, people of lower status look down on high status people also because after all, who did they think they are? And these are the kinds of things that men and women are tempted to boast about every day, aren't they? Wealth, power, ancestry, fame, beauty. When we have to go looking for a new job, aren't these the things they ask us about? Tell me a little bit about your qualifications. Talk to me about your last job. Tell me some of your accomplishments. See, the Bible says that everyone is seeking his own glory. And although we didn't talk about it last week, we read the section in in Galatians where Paul warned the Galatians not to become seekers of empty glory. Religion lies to us when it promises us peace with God, but the flesh lies to us when it says that our empty glory, our trophies and our attainments will create for us happiness. Our vain flesh despises the cross because it hates the humility that it sees there. The flesh likes accomplishments. It doesn't really want to believe that it needs the sacrifice that Jesus made upon his cross. It doesn't want to believe that maybe what I'm chasing, the things that will bring me credit, will bring me glory, are not quite that important in the long run. Rich people and poor people alike, slaves and free men, everybody has to wrestle with the cross. Because the cross does not listen to us. It does not give us heed as we pronounce our status and our position. The cross, church, forces me to look at Jesus' blood, and it forces me to admit that this is what I need no matter who I am. We have to admit at the foot of that cross, that we are all the same. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the cross is the cure that God says we all need. Christians in the early church could call each other brother because they knew they were equal. They knew that they had received the same remedy. Roman society was disgusted that wealthy women would mingle with illiterate slaves in a house church and that they would actually call themselves brother and sister. That was one of the things that the Romans found to be most disgraceful about Christians. And it wasn't just about recognizing that we have a common humanity. They knew, the believers knew that they were all the same because every one of them had had to come through the same door to meet God, to come into God's presence. 
Each one had come through the door of the cross. Out of gratitude for that cross, they viewed their accomplishments as very small things indeed. So Paul would say in Philippians, all of those accomplishments that I had, whatever gain I had, I counted them as lost for the sake of Christ. Indeed, now I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And for his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them rubbish. Literally, he said dung. Uh, he really did. So you can check that out later if you like. But he said, I count all of those things as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Maybe if we haven't gained as much of Christ as we should or as we would like to yet, maybe it's because we haven't brought all of our trash out to the curb yet. If you can't say amen, say, oh my. Paul says, God forbid that I should glory any longer in any of those things, things that bring me no peace and that puff me up with pride. But because of the cross, I'm free. I don't have to live that way. So may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we boast in the cross? The cross is superior to religion. Second, it's superior to the flesh. And the third reason we boast in the cross is this. The cross is superior to the world. The cross is superior to the world. Marianne, once again, I hope I can hang on to a few friends. Paul said that by the cross, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Paul says because of the cross, the world has become dead to me and I've become dead to to the world. The world became something detestable to Paul. And guess what? The world returned the favor, didn't care for Paul very much at all. What is the world? Is it the earth itself? Is that what he means? No. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. But the world is a different matter. And the scriptures teaching, the words of Jesus concerning the world are very sober and very important for us to get a grip of. When the Bible speaks of the world, it means the principles of this current age. It means the way that the world is organized, the way that the systems of the world cooperate without God. It's the way that the world organizes its governments, its commerce, its finance, the way that the world structures its education and all such things without God and in opposition to God. The world means mankind in everything that we do as we refuse to come under the headship, the leadership of Jesus Christ. Jesus has the right to rule, amen? But he has not yet taken his power and begun to reign directly over the nations of the earth. Someday we know that Jesus will come and he will establish his kingdom here because the Bible says that he is king of kings and he is Lord of lords. Praise the Lord. And for 2,000 years, Christians have prayed for that. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And it will happen. But the Bible says we don't yet see everything placed under his feet. So here we are in the kingdom of this world, and Jesus said, you are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. For the time being, the world system has its own preferred prince. Jesus said, the devil is the prince of this world. The principles of this current age and its selfishness are ultimately a reflection of that wicked spirit that the Bible says is now ruling in the lives of disobedient people. What are the values of the world? Let's be careful, church. Let's examine ourselves and where we're at. Let's pay attention to the drift of our souls. Jesus said, one of the hardest things that Jesus ever said for us to get a grip of, he said, the things that are highly esteemed by men are an abomination in the sight of God. Yikes. So we have to be careful to ask ourselves if we have adopted the values of the world system that dishonors Jesus Christ. We must ask ourselves if we've begun to conform to them. God help us to think about these things. What does the world say to us? What is the world saying to us, church, about money? compared to what the kingdom of heaven is saying to us about money? What is the world saying to us about raising our kids? 
What is the world saying to us about how we should treat the elderly or the pre-born? What does the world say about fashion? What does the world say about music? What is the world saying to us about human sexuality? What does the world say is important to us? What are the messages that the world is pumping out 24-7 to our kids and our grandkids about how they should live? The Bible's very clear. The Apostle John was very blunt. He said, love not the world, neither the things in the world. If anyone does love the world, then the love of the Father is not in him. Thank God we have something better than this old world. The Bible says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. The new creation is good, but in order to enjoy it, we're going to need to view the world as an old thing that has no claim on our hearts. Let's embrace the new creation, embrace that new way of life where we take off, as the Bible says, the old man and put on Christ. See, the Bible says that God has taken us, he's transferred us out of the kingdom of darkness, and he's removed us over into the kingdom of the son of his love. We can't live both kinds of lives, one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. It's a recipe for unhappiness. I think that a worldly Christian is one of the most miserable people because the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. The lifestyle of kingdom living, the life that you and I tap into when we follow what Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you, that is the life of the new creation. And it's characterized by righteousness, peace, and joy. Are you living in that new creation? Because Paul is telling us today that that is all that really matters. He says that circumcision, religion, all of those religious arguments, all of those things do not avail. They do, in other words, they do not help me at all to live as a new creation in Christ Jesus. So we need to search our own hearts today, church, all of us, you and I. Are we attracted to the world? Are we attracted to the things that we actually escaped from the first time when we met Jesus? Embracing the cross and boasting in the cross means rejecting this world. It means that I've made a choice. It means that the ways of this world are dead to me now because I have chosen a better pathway. I have chosen a better road. I have chosen the way of Jesus who says, love not the world. The cross teaches us that soon and very soon, this world is going to be under some new management. Amen. So we may as well get started on considering it an old dead thing because the Bible says this world is fading away to nothing. And if you don't know Jesus, then sooner or later, you're bound to discover that this world is actually really a kingdom that is loaded with disappointment. Paul says, thank God. The cross of Jesus has set me free from having to live according to the false and destructive wisdom of this world. So Paul gets excited. He says, God forbid that I should glory, that I should boast in anything except the cross of Jesus. Because it's that cross that set me free from slavery and it set me free from the wisdom of this world. The cross tells me that I am free and that I have become a citizen now of the kingdom of heaven. We boast in Jesus' cross because it's superior to religion and the flesh and the world. And finally this, we glory in the cross of Christ because the cross is the way to mercy and peace. The cross is the way to mercy and peace. Worship team, you can come back if you would, please. Paul said there in verse 16, And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. That word rule there, it means a measuring stick. It means a standard, a way of life. It means a guideline. Now, this is a little ironic on the part of Paul because, as you know, if you've been with us, Paul just spent an entire letter, chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. He spent the entire letter telling us, try to make sure that you don't rely on the rules of the law to know God. But now, at the very end of the letter, he says there is a rule to follow. 
But it's the rule, it's the way of the cross. It's recognizing that religion can't save us, that the flesh can't satisfy us, and that this world is not my home. That is the way of the cross, and the cross gives me the power to live according to that road. See, the cross teaches us that Jesus' blood is the only way to receive mercy from God and to experience his peace. Paul wants the whole people to know that. He's talking to the Israel that's comprised not only of every Jewish believer, but every Gentile person who's been grafted into God's people. Mercy comes from receiving the benefit of the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us is qualified for heaven on our own. You know that Solomon asked mankind a very distressing question. He said, who can say, I have made my heart clean and I'm pure from my sin? It's very alarming, but yet nonetheless very true what the Bible says, that the wages of sin is death. But thank God the Bible also tells us the wonderful story of the mercy of God in sending his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. The Bible tells us that all we like sheep have gone astray. We have each turned aside, every one of us, to his own way. But the Lord has laid upon Jesus the iniquity of us all. Thank God. Jesus took the punishments for our sins, every one of them, so that when we believe in him, we can go free. The penalty, the price for my sins was paid for by Jesus upon his cross. I want you to hear these wonderful words again and reflect upon them. Maybe somebody here today is hearing them for the very first time. Maybe you heard them for the first time and understood them decades ago. But the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world through him might be saved. Mercy can be yours today through the cross of Jesus Christ. Not just mercy, but peace also is in the deal. Peace with God because we have the forgiveness of our sins. And because of that, we're no longer in a state of conflict. We're no longer in a state of war with God. He will adopt you as a son, as a daughter today. The Bible says that therefore, since we've been made right in the sight of God by faith, we have peace with God now because of what's been done by our Lord Jesus Christ. You can come into that new dimension of life and become a new creation. Jesus called it being born again because it's just such a radical change as that. What's the message of the letter to Galatians? What's Paul's final takeaway for us? It's that being in a new creation and being a new creation is all that really matters. I can never find lasting peace or become a child of God through religion, through the accomplishments and attainments of my flesh. I can never get lasting satisfaction from this world that is fading away. Those things are crucified and dead to me now. I have a better path. God forbid that I should ever return to those old things. So instead, I will make my boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, let's stand together. And let's give some praise and some thanks to Jesus for his cross. Thank you, Lord.